Hey guys I'm Yurizi. This story is all about what if Naruto was an Umbu captain. Drafted into Umbu at a young age, Naruto is guided to the path of a captain. Leader of Team Sigma, the Hokage's personal guard, Naruto will lead his team and defend his village to the best of his ability. Threats besiege the land of fire from all sides, and only Naruto stands before them. Before we proceed with the story, please like and subscribe to this channel if you liked the video and don't forget to check the description for the other works of the author if you liked the story. Let's start. Chapter 7, Chains of Hatred 3, Sabotage Kanaha burned. Great plumes of greasy, black smoke rose up into the sunny sky. The streets were cracked and littered with thousands upon thousands of kunai. Windows had been smashed, walls had been knocked over entire buildings had collapsed in on themselves. The shattered husks of homes and businesses roared with flames as shinobi desperately worked together to put out the terrible fires. A powerful technique had been set off over the Naka River, which trailed from the beyond the Uchiha clan grounds and through the middle of the village. Not only had a key bridge been destroyed but the river had been diverted into parts of the village and shinobi struggled to fuel their water techniques with the available water. Kanaha's warriors burned. Grim-faced shinobi, their faces stained with ash and soot, retrieved headbands and ninja identification tags from the corpses of their comrades. Bodies were covered with grimy blankets. Protocol dictated that a Kanaha shinobi was to be cremated after death so that the secrets and techniques of the village were kept hidden. A large mound of bodies blazed with fire as superheated chakra reduced flesh and bone to ash. It was a horrible and messy task, usually suited for the specialized crematoriums in the hospital but they had been damaged and there were far too many casualties. Secrets needed to be kept and the disease could not be allowed to spread amongst the living so the bodies of their friends and families were put to the flame. Kanaha was hurting but by no means was the blow that had been inflicted fatal. No later than ten minutes after the last Skynin had disappeared over the horizon then had Kanaha's village council convened. The Hokage and his advisors, the Umbu and Jonin commander and selected Jonin squad leaders and clan heads met in a small but secured room underneath the Hokage's tower. The Hokage sat there in silence, his eyes hidden from behind his hat, as the council listened to a report given to them. Umbu medical squad has been dispatched to locate survivors trapped in the rubble, the dragon masked Umbu said quietly. The hospital is nearing full capacity and we have erected temporary tents to take care of the wounded. All medicnin have reported in for duty and non-essential personnel are assisting. There was a visiting team from Taki who were caught in the battle, Homura informed them. They have left behind several shinobi with medical training to assist us while they inform their leader of what has transpired. Sarutobi remained quiet. His eyes were fixated on the three vacant seats around the table seats that had been filled with some of his top jonin less than an hour ago. Two were receiving medical treatment, one critical, while the third had been killed during the invasion. He closed his eye with a sigh and listened to his men and women converse. We need to decide on our next course of action, Yamanaka Inoichi said firmly. The blonde-haired man sat next to his two former teammates. I have sent a message to the fire daimyo, Koharu said her voice somewhat wavering. She coughed twice and shook her head. The twelve ninja guardians will see to his protection. The sky ninja will not find an easy target at the capital. All shinobi in the vicinity of Kanaha have been recalled, Narashikaku, the jonin commander, said. His scarred face was deep in thought. We are rebuilding our defenses and rotating our shinobi force. What we do next is a matter for the Hokage. Eyes turned to Sarutobi, who kept his head bowed. There was an awkward pause before the Umbu commander broke the silence. If I may ask, he murmured politely. What losses did we sustain during this attack? Final numbers aren't out yet but we're looking at about 650 dead, twice that wounded, replied Ryota Yakushi, head of Kanaha's medical corp. Strategically speaking, only around 4% of Kanaha's total military force was killed. It is still a staggering loss not seen since the Third Great War, Inoichi pointed out. I'm concerned about morale. For many of the new generation, this will be their first real war one that has taken place at home. People are upset and disheartened. How shall the others of the Great Five react to this, I wonder, Homura mused out loud. Shinobi hold grudges for a very long time, Kohara said quietly. It could mean war. No. 
Sarutobi spoke up for the first time. He lifted his eyes and they were as hard as stone. The other villages will not break the fragile peace we have not over this. They too are at risk. They will watch and wait and see what happens. Can we count on Suna to send aid? Chowza rumbled out. He sat cross-legged on the floor, still tall enough to see over the table. Officially, yes. Unofficially, not a chance, Shikaku answered dryly. We might be able to organize a defense the bordering minor countries, if only to deter international interference on this matter. We will not defend, Sarutobi murmured but everybody heard him. They stopped talking and looked as the third Hokage took a deep breath. The enemy has cut us but it is a shallow cut and the bleeding will stop. We need to ensure that the enemy will not cut us again. We must launch a counter-attack. Quiet murmurs broke out at that. Sarutobi was one that had seen a lifetime of war and usually favored diplomacy and negotiation over battle. However, there were some things that could not be forgiven in an attack on the very heart of fire country and Kanaha was not something that could be allowed to slide. We cannot attack an enemy we can't find, Hyuga Hayashi pointed out logically. The white-robed man was expressionless. We lack information. Then let's analyze what we already know, Shikaku said. He stood and gestured at one of the umbu guarding from the shadows. The masked shinobi unraveled a large map of fire country and its immediate surrounding borders on the table. We have three issues at hand, Shikaku continued. He counted on his fingers. The first being the location of the enemy, the second being our means to arrive at that location and the third mustering an army to attack. The umbu commander shifted forward, silver mask gleaming. I can provide a solution for the second and third of those problems, he offered. Umbu Combat Platoon, Delta was conducting training exercises nearby. They have received their orders and will arrive back in Kanaha in approximately an hour. We have enough of our reserves to muster together another platoon and still leave three here for Kanaha's defense. How will they travel there? One of the Jonin squad leaders asked. Sky Country could very well send another wave before a counter-attack can be made. We will use the enemy's strengths to our advantage, the Umbu commander replied. There is a possibility that they have constructed a forward base only reachable by flight. We will use Kanaha's Hawk Summoning Contract as our means of transportation. Hawk Summoning Contract? Chauza asked curiously. I wasn't aware that we possessed such a thing. We breed thousands of birds to act as our messengers, the commander explained. There is an ongoing project to develop or grow new Class 5 summoning creatures. At the present moment, we have six Class 3 summoning hawks. Each could hold about seven or eight shinobi. Why wasn't this used during the invasion? One of the other Jonin frowned. The Umbu commander cocked his head. It is my job to look at the big picture. Half a dozen Class 3 aerial summons would not have contributed much if anything against a superior sized and better trained force. Now, though, they may be of use. Two Umbu platoons against an entire division, Inoichi murmured. Perhaps even more than one we have no information on the disposition of their forces. We were unable to take any prisoners alive and we're having trouble extracting information from the dead. Fail safe, perhaps, Homura said thoughtfully. They have had decades to study our doctrine. Are two platoons enough to defeat Sky Country? Yakushi Ryota asked. You misunderstand, the Umbu commander said. The overarching issue here is to prevent Sky Country from launching another aerial raid. We do not have to defeat them all merely halt their advance. There are a number of factors at play here, Shikaku said suddenly. We have many questions and very few answers. Was this the entirety of Sky Ninja's army? Is there another battalion on its way already? How long will it take the Sky Nin to recover their chakra? What are their current levels of equipment and supplies? By what means do they launch their mechanical winged devices into the air? Most importantly, just where have they constructed their base of operations? We cannot act without the answer to at least some of those questions, Hayashi agreed. Shikaku, Sarutobi spoke up quietly. The Nara turned to him. Can we track the Skynin back to their base of operations? Shikaku frowned. I have several similar accounts given to me by the Hyuga. They each report that the Sky Shinobi arrived at the battle with just approximately two-thirds of their chakra. 
They continued the battle until they have roughly one third remaining. He paused. It's only logical to assume that the remaining third was to see them return back to base safely. Hayashi stepped in. My clansmen and I observed the rate at which the flying apparatus was consuming chakra and reported this to military intelligence. Shikaku grabbed a pencil and drew a large circle throughout fire country. With the rate of chakra depletion, they must have come from somewhere in this area. However, we also know that Gamma Team was intercepted and attacked around here, he made a cross on the map, southeast of Kanaha and close to the code. This leaves only this remaining area as a possibility. He cross-hatched the map and stood back. That's close to Wave Country, Kohara pointed out. Hasn't there been a disturbance there recently something about a public execution? Hatake Kakashi's Genin team is in Wave Country escorting a client home, Sarutobi pondered this fact carefully. The timing is convenient, Homura remarked. I'll redo my calculations but it is my opinion that Wave Country is too far out to be the point of origin of the Skynin, Shikaku said. We have already formed several possibilities for where they may have come from. Taking into account the need for privacy, the Skynin needed to have avoided major roads and towns and, until today, kept out of the way of Umbu patrols. We would still need to second a recon team out to find them before we could launch an attack, Hayashi pointed out. No, Sarutobi murmured thoughtfully. Perhaps we don't. At the deep crater where the southeastern Umbu rest house used to reside the remains of Gamma Team's 4th squad and Iota Team remained hidden in a partially hollowed out trunk. The huge tree soared high into the sky, far higher than what should be possible, and its canopy melded with those of the trees around it to create an almost impenetrable barrier that blocked out the view of the sky. If they could not see up then the enemy could not see down. A little while ago the enemy's air force had flown overhead, away from the direction of Kanaha and back towards wherever they had come from. Naruto had felt a stab of vicious glee as he noticed that as far he could tell there were far less of the enemy flying back from the village than there had been flying to it. Still, the fact that there were still enemies left indicated that the Leaf's defense had not been perfect. Undoubtedly, there would be casualties. Shinobi he had worked with, joked with, begged for help against the tyrannical third Hokage and his totally unfair habits who knew how many of them had died. Naruto felt his brows furrow as he suddenly found that he couldn't really put a lot of names to the faces that flashed through his head. Certainly, he would be distraught at the thought of his fellow comrades falling in battle against the enemy, but apart from the third Hokage, and Kano Amaru, as much it pained him to admit, there were very few shinobi that were his friends. Naruto abruptly let out a loud sigh and shook his head, clearing them of the strangely troubling thoughts. He looked up from where he was sitting and watched the rest of the umbu as they all went about their various tasks. Tawa and Yuka were dozing quietly, their backs pressed up against the trunk of the trees. As useful as the umbu masks were, they did not make for a very comfortable nap and the two members had taken them off and were pressed up against each other, using their cloaks as makeshift pillow. Some shinobi might have wolf whistled at the sight of the two exhausted shinobi huddling in against each other. Naruto was young but he was umbu he recognized that there were no stronger bonds than between fellow comrade in arms. The squad leaders, Komake and Kage, were talking to each other quietly as they poured over a field map. Daichi was nearby, the rather enthusiastic Hyuga consulting with the two senior officers. From what Naruto understood, they were trying to determine the point of origin of the enemy's attack by using the chakra levels of the shinobi and the rate of chakra consumption of the flying machines. Naruto had tried to keep up, determined to be of some use, but the maths involved was far beyond his level and his head had only hurt the more he tried to understand. In the end, he had decided that it was probably more beneficial to rest and build up his strength. His chakra was still in top condition it was rare where the young blonde could burn through chakra faster than the rate his body would naturally create it but he had been mentally exhausted. It had been a long day. Briefly, he wondered if this was what Hatake Kakashi or Uchiha Itachi had felt when they had first joined Umbu at a young age. Actually, they probably had it worse. Naruto had his natural awesomeness to compensate where Kakashi had only had his perverted little books and Itachi his sociopathic tendencies and desire to brutally execute his entire family. Ferret, Komaka called. Come here. Naruto jumped to his feet and jugged past Tawa and Yuka. He joined his commanding officer at and knelt beside her as she poured over the map. 
We've determined that the enemy must have come from around here. Komaka pointed to Fire Country's eastern coast. She tracked her finger up to Port City, one of Fire Country's coastal cities just north of Wave Country on the other side of the bay. She brought the finger down and traced over the coast. That's the entire coastline of the Sea of Whirlpools a large area. It might have come from Wave Country, Naruto muttered. He made an odd noise from behind his mask. Actually, there's a Genin team operation over the coast in Wave Hatake Kakashi. He might have seen something. I don't think they would have had quite enough chakra to make it to wave, Daichi spoke up with an easy smile. He threw his hands up helplessly. I'm not an expert or anything but I think they're probably somewhere at the southern end of the coast. It's less populated and our patrols are much less frequent there. They could have built a base of operations in the wilderness and slowly moved in equipment to prepare for their invasion, Komakam used. Regardless, Kage spoke up quietly. We need to inform the Hokage of our calculations. It's likely that they too have come to the same conclusion but more data never hurts. I'll summon a messenger, Naruto said and stood up. He took off one of his gloves and reached up to his mouth, an abnormally sharp canine biting into his thumb. Blood was drawn and he smeared it over the palm of his hand, flipping through some seals. Summoning Techni Dash, he began. A puff of smoke and a loud pop filled the hollowed-out trunk and Naruto took an immediate step back. From the smoke came Inma, the Monkey King, and he did not look too pleased. His yellow eyes glanced over Komaki, who looked just as startled as Naruto, and Kage, who probably was as startled but hid it much better, and came to rest on Naruto. You. He snapped grumpily. He reached into his pouch and Naruto swallowed nervously. He had a lot of painful memories of Inma reaching into his equipment and pulling out random spiky and sharp instruments. Instead of pulling out a weapon, however, Inma brought out a gleaming white orb. It was about the size of a large grapefruit. What's that? Daichi asked in puzzlement. The Hokage's crystal ball? Naruto breathed in horror. What are you doing with that? Are you trying to get me beat up, you stupid monkey? The old man's gonna kill me when he finds out I have that. Shut up, you miserable little brat. Inma roared. He reared up. Here I am doing Sarutobi a favor and acting far below my status and you start spouting off nonsense. Think before you speak. Don't tell me what to do. Naruto growled heatedly. The Monkey King and the Nine-Tailed Host bumped head, narrowing their eyes at each other. There was practically electricity flying between them as Kage and Komaka shared a bemused look. Daichi just chuckled while Yuka and Tawa emerged from where they had been sleeping. Nobody could sleep through an argument between Naruto and the Monkey King. The white-furred bipedal summon was just like the third Hokage except worse, if such a thing was possible, and Naruto had a streak of stubbornness that neither Inma or Sarutobi could break. The third Hokage had tried once and only once to ignore an argument between the two. It had degenerated from heated words to a screaming match and then to blows. It had only been when Inma had gotten cranky and had thrown a house at Naruto that Sarutobi had intervened. Naruto claimed it had been less of a house and more of a garden shed. Regardless, the concussion he had received had not endeared him to the Monkey King at all. Inma huffed. Stupid boy, he growled. Your Hokage gave this to me to give to you. There is an urgent matter that he has to speak to you about. Naruto's clenching fist lowered and his mood abruptly swung around. He nodded at Inma seriously and ignored the slightly incredulous umbu around him as he stepped forward. Inma took a deep breath and concentrated, one hand raised to form a seal and the other holding onto the crystal ball. What is that, ferret? Kage asked softly. It's the focus for the third Hokage's telescope technique, Naruto answered. It lets the Hokage lock onto a person's chakra pattern and observe them. It doesn't really work out of the village that well, so Inma must be doing something to dash. Can you hear me? Naruto paused. His eyes focused on the crystal ball in Inma's hand. Message repeats, Ferret, designated as captain of Sigma Squad, can you hear me? Sir. Naruto called out. He paused, scratching the back of his head. I can hear you, sir, he replied in an affirmative. You are being assigned a priority mission, Sarutobi spoke through the glowing crystal ball. Inma was sweating as he held it in the palm of his hand, channeling Chakra through it. 
Do you have a field map ready? There was a rustle of paper from behind him. Affirmative, Naruto confirmed. Mission focus, reconnaissance. You are to link up with any available Umbu personnel and patrol through sections G4-5 to G5-9. The enemy has been identified as Sky Country. Locate signs of Sky Country's presence in those areas and report back. Understood, Naruto called out. There was scribbling on the map from behind them. There was a pause. As of this moment, Sigma team has full operational control of this mission, the Hokage finally spoke. All available local Umbu assets are transferred to Sigma's jurisdiction. All pending missions have been placed on hold. This mission takes full priority. Naruto's eyes were wide. Yes, sir, he said numbly. If located, Sigma team is to report back to Umbu command, Sarutobi concluded. Inma has volunteered to transmit vital information. He will be designated as Sigma team's communications office. Summon him when needed. There was a pause. Good luck, Naruto. The will of fire shall illuminate your path. The ball abruptly dimmed and Inma let out an audible sigh. He carefully placed the valuable crystal ball back in his pouch and stared down at Naruto with his fierce yellow eyes. Naruto, for his part, still felt numb. Full operational command? Sure, he had ran many operations before but they had been simple DNC ranked missions organizing squads of Chunin on local and in non-combat scenarios. Naruto, Inma broke into his thoughts and Naruto realized he must had been standing there for a while. The Monkey King was eyeing him with an expression that he had never seen on him before. The third Hokage has placed his faith in you. Do not let him down. And with that, Naruto's resolve returned. Yes, he said quietly. Inma nodded gravely and disappeared in a puff of smoke. Naruto turned back to his fellow Umbu members and found them knelt before him. Komaki, his former commanding office, rose up. Captain, she murmured. What are your orders? Gather our equipment, Naruto said and he issued his very first order. He took a deep breath. We move out in five. Tenzo stalked through the darkened corridors of the Umbu headquarters. His white mask gleamed in the torchlight as he silently made his way to the door at the end of the hallway. Two Umbu stared at him but made no move to stop him as he opened the door and stepped through it. The third Hokage sat in the center of the small room, conferring quietly with the Umbu commander. Both men looked up as Tenzo bowed his head respectfully. Hokage-sama, Commander-sama, he greeted. His voice was monotone. Reporting for duty is ordered. Ah, excellent, the Hokage murmured. He rubbed his hands together. You may sit. Tenzo took the offered chair and sat down stiffly. His well-trained eyes spotted the signs of battle underneath the Hokage's robes and his nose picked up on blood and fire and smoke and ash. As somebody who had been in Umbu from the age of six, he remained quiet and waited for his superiors to address him. I trust that you are aware of current events, the Hokage asked him quietly. I am. Tenzo nodded. Good, Sarutobi said briskly. I have a priority mission for US rank, of course. Do you accept? The word was a mere formality and all three men in the room knew it. Tenzo had graduated the academy at the age of six and had made Chunin only mere months later. Due to the unique circumstances surrounding him, he had been inducted into Umbu and had undergone specialized training in order to bring out his talents. His power over Mokutan was only a fraction of what the first Hokage had been capable of but it had been enough to raise him to the very top of the elite. After learning much from Hatake Kakashi, Tenzo had been assigned leadership of Umbu's Delta team. In the three years since, Tenzo had achieved the second best performance record of any Umbu serving under the third Hokage only falling short of Uzumaki Naruto, where his position as Umbu's Sigma team and the personal assistant of the third Hokage had seen the young boy perform an unprecedented amount of DNC ranked missions. To date, Tenzo had never refused or failed a mission nor had he lost a single man or woman in combat. It was a record that he was immensely proud of and one that no Umbu before him, not even the legendary Sunin or the White Fang could claim. Yes, Tenzo answered firmly. The Umbu commander slid a mission brief across the table and Tenzo picked it up. You will take command of two Umbu combat platoons, Team Delta and a mixture of battle-ready squads from Team Bravo and Epsilon. 
Thor will be your second in command. The Hawk summoning contract has been allocated for the success of this mission. You will fly to Kanaha's Umbu safe house splinter and hold, Sarutobi continued from where the commander had left off. Team Sigma is currently on a reconnaissance mission to locate the Sky Country's stronghold. Once located, a summon creature will be dispatched to your position and coordinates and further information will be provided. Our information is lacking, the commander spoke. His silver mask revealed nothing. We know nothing of their numbers, defenses, or the layout of their base. We know some of their techniques and strategies it's in your brief but you'll be essentially going in blind. Your mission stands as follows, you are to delay and disrupt Sky Country's ability to launch further attacks on Fire Country soil, the third Hokage declared. Use any means necessary. Do you understand? Yes, Hokage-sama, Tenzo said crisply. The mission parameters are clear to me. We shall defend the village from further attack. Excellent, the Hokage said and smiled grimly. Your platoon leaves in 15 minutes. Dismissed. At heart, the Shadow Clone technique had been designed for reconnaissance and information gathering purposes. A Shadow Clone had physical form and could open doors and move around obstacles in ways that many other scouting techniques could not. A Shadow Clone also had a certain level of independence and could perform tasks without direct oversight. Most importantly, the Shadow Clone technique could and had been integrated with Yamanaka mind techniques. When molded properly, a Shadow Clone was able to transmit a copy of the electrical activity occurring in the brain back in a stream of chakra to its point of origin its creator. For the most part, the creator received whatever the Shadow Clone had experienced. There were some limitations. The Shadow Clone technique required massive amounts of chakra to use, more chakra than the average shinobi possessed. The further away the clone was the longer it took for the chakra stream to return to its creator. The Shadow Clone also had to be molded in a very specific way depending on what type of sense stimuli the creator wanted to receive. Sight and sound were generally the most common type but there were specific Shadow Clones that had been designed to sniff out chemical weapons and test food for poison. The sense of touch was almost never included, no creator wanted to experience the death of the clone, especially in a combat area. The rarest type of shadow clone was one that transmitted everything. They were the rarest and the most dangerous. The human brain worked perfectly fine transmitting and decoding a single set of stimuli that of the original body. A second set caused an extremely large amount of mental strain and a third set could cause irreparable mental damage, rupture the brain and scramble the neural pathways. Despite the obvious advantages that this type of clone offered its creator, especially when training a new skill, it was practically never used. Naruto was the anomaly. Not only had he been gifted with the old blood of the Uzumaki clan, a bloodline that stemmed all the way back to the time of the Sage of the Six Paths, but he was the host of the Nine-Tailed Demon Fox, which gave him absurdly amounts of chakra and a boost to his natural stamina and resilience. Even he wouldn't make more than ten of those types of clones. He used a variety of shadow clones to continue his five-year progress into elemental and shape manipulation but only rarely did he require a full set of stimuli from those clones. On his mission to locate Sky Country's stronghold Naruto used his almost inhuman chakra reserves to create dozens of shadow clones. They scattered all over the countryside, crisscrossing each other as they bounded from tree to tree. Each clone had been designed to transmit visual stimuli back in the event that they found something but they also had the independence to choose not to send back information if it wasn't necessary. Naruto had no desire to see every single tree in the fire country. With the remnants of an Umbu Recon team, the Byakugan, and a somewhat adept sensor type Nin by his side, it did not take the young Umbu long to find what he was looking for. With a blur of movement, six black streaks launched from the last tree and landed gracefully on the ground. They sped across the withering grass, traveling tens of meters in a flash, and bounded past the last of the plants and shrubs and onto a large plain of sand. Their feet seemed to touch the sand but left no imprints as the small group bounded up a large sand dune and paused as they reached the top. There. Naruto hissed, jabbing his fingers out to see from the top of dune. There they are. Team Sigma continued their fast-paced trek across the rippling sand. Their speed had increased and they were practically sprinting for the small rocky outcropping at the top of the coastal cliffs. They jumped up Komaka spun around and withdrew a large sheet-like piece of cloth and they landed on the ledge. A second later, 
The cloth came settling down over them and they each stilled. The cloth settled around them, creating a slightly transparent layer to peer out of, while the outside layer settled on a mixture of brown and gray that blended in with the landscape around them. Moments later, a pair of Skynin zoomed overhead and passed them. Naruto watched them with bated breath. His heart was racing in his chest as he tracked the patrolling Sky Shinobi. Relief began to flood his mind as the flyers soared past them without altering course. They had not been seen. Naruto turned and silently tapped Daichi on the shoulder. The Hyuga tilted his head and watched as Naruto drew a little circle in the air with his finger. Daichi gave a short shake and pressed his hand to his head in apparent pain. We're clear, Naruto murmured. As Yuka and Tawa watched their backs, Naruto joined Komaki and Kage at the end of the blanket as the two experienced Umbu members stared down at the enemy. Waves crashed against the cliffs with a loud roar below them. Their mission was complete. They had found the enemy. Contrary to what Naruto had been expecting, Sky Country had not built a forward base on the mainland. Instead, Naruto saw, they had arrived here via a fleet of ships. There were eight of them, three large and five small. The smaller ships were slender, a single tower rising from a curved deck. They were clearly patrol boats for the gargantuan carriers that followed. They were huge, a large tower of metal and stone rising from two thick cylinders that bobbed up and down on the water. Each resulting building must have been as tall as the Hokage's tower and large stone faces had been carved into the sides. At the top of the tower was the deck of the ship, where tiny little black specks crawled all over it. As Naruto watched, there was a small flash of light and a pair of golden streaks zoomed from one side of the deck to the other. They wobbled in the air as they flew off the deck but almost immediately gained height and began their patrol. A fleet, Kage murmured from beside Naruto. It's a mobile fleet with the capability to launch airborne raids right in the middle of fire country. What a powerful concept. For once there was emotion in the blank-faced Umbu's voice. Naruto couldn't tell if it was respect or fear. Kage, Komake, take notes, he ordered determinately. Yuka, work out our exact coordinates. We need to report this location right away. Kage fumbled through his pack and pulled out a pair of binoculars. Komaka pulled out her marker and together they started talking quietly to each other, describing key aspects of Sky Country's fleet and jotting down notes and sketches. Yuka opened her field map and began to pinpoint exactly where they were while Naruto flashed through some signs and summoned a small monkey. He took Yuka's hurried scribbling and gave it to the chittering little thing. Take this to our earlier location, he told the monkey. Run as quick as you can. The monkey disappeared in a blur of movement. Naruto glanced at Daichi, who nodded wordlessly, and made the same signs again. He pressed his hand down on the warm sand and another puff of smoke appeared. When it dissipated, Inma lay on the ground next to him. He wordlessly held up the crystal ball and Naruto waited. The ball began to glow and the Hokage's voice emerged from it. Team Sigma, report. The enemy has been located, Hokage-sama, Naruto said quietly. He gave the Hokage the coordinates. Sir, the enemy possesses a fleet of eight ships. There are three large ships which seem to launch the Sky Shinobi into the air. The remainder are smaller patrol vessels. A sea fleet and an air force, the Hokage sounded grim. Our enemies are indeed powerful. Well done, Team Sigma. You have performed well. Captains Tenzo and Bor are en route to Splinter Rest House and will take control of this situation from here. The coordinates have been sent. Naruto said. Excellent. I knew I could trust you with this task, Naruto, the third Hokage said. During a time of great need you have served your village well. Congratulations. Naruto felt a smile bloom across his face and was glad that the mask hit his features as his cheeks reddened with pleased embarrassment. He scratched the back of his head and laughed nervously. He couldn't help but feel proud of himself. Ferret. Daichi suddenly called out. We have movement. Naruto swung his head back to the ships. He did not have the superior eyes of a Hyuga but even he could tell that more and more black specks were gathering on the deck of the ships. Kage and Komaki exchanged looks with each other and turned to Naruto expectedly, while Sarutobi remained silent on his end of the crystal ball. What can you see? Naruto asked Daichi. Have we been spotted? I don't think so, 
Daiichi murmured. It looks like a mission briefing. I can see some moving platforms bringing up those flying devices. He paused. There are hundreds of them. They are preparing to launch another attack, Komaka said quietly. She absently brushed her brown bangs away from her mask. They must have recovered their chakra. Team Sigma. The Hokage barked and Naruto almost flinched. I am assigning you another mission. You are to do all you can to delay the enemy's departure. Umbu reinforcements are en route but will not arrive until later. Stop them from launching their second attack. Yes, sir, Naruto responded grimly. There are two secondary objectives, the Hokage continued after a beat. Firstly, if possible, cripple the enemy's vessels so that they cannot leave the area. Secondly, attempt to capture a senior officer for interrogation. Understood, Naruto said with a nod. We'll report back once we have achieved our mission. The crystal ball dimmed and Inma disappeared with a puff of smoke. Feeling all eyes on him, Naruto swallowed and turned to face his squad his subordinates. His mind was racing, Naruto almost panicked but he forced himself to calm down and considered all of his options. What equipment do we have left? He asked after a few moments. They pooled in their remaining equipment. There were only a few shuriken left but they had at least two dozen kunai altogether, as well as several spools of wire and rolls of bandages. Komaki had dozens hundreds, even of Senbon and Kage had small little book that Naruto first thought was Icha Icha. It turned out to be full of explosive notes. Kage shrugged underneath all the looks he got. Okay, Naruto said abruptly. We have lots of things to do and not a lot of time so we're going to split up. Yuka. You and Daiichi will identify and capture an enemy officer. I'm sure that you can extract some information from Askainen on one of the patrol boats and work yourself up if you have to. Gotcha. Daiichi said and gave him thumbs up. Isn't he so cute when he's bossy? Yuka asked with a saucy wink. I have considerable infiltration experience. I should be able to tag the bottom of each of the ships without being seen, Kage offered. Naruto nodded. Good. That leaves Komake, Tawa, and me to attack the enemy ships. He recalled watching the flyer launch into the air. I think that they need the deck to launch their craft. If we can damage or destroy it then we should slow them down. Sounds good, Tawa said. He slapped a first in his palm and Naruto could picture the vicious grin behind his bird mask. I'm dying to give these arseholes some payback. The sheer hatred behind the other Umbu's words made Naruto feel uncomfortable. He ignored them and turned back to watching the sea. The enemy fleet bobbed up and down on the surface of the ocean, which glittered majestically as the sun shone down brightly. It was very peaceful and tranquil a great place for some leave, Naruto decided wistfully. Let's go, was all he said. Naruto breathed deeply, his stomach rising and falling, as he slowly propelled himself through the dark depths of the floor of the sea. His breath rang loudly in his ears, a sharp contrast to the void of silence from all around him. His umbu mask formed a seamless and airtight cavity around his mouth and certain parts of it could act in a similar fashion as a rebreather. Compared to the technology of the water country and the village hidden in the mist the rebreather was inefficient and sorely lacking. For the purpose of this mission, it would do the job. The sun shone brightly above and Naruto could see the dark bottoms of the ships rocking gently on the surface of the ocean. He kicked his legs in the water, swimming further in until he was directly underneath the surface of his designated target carrier. He was too wary to use chakra so he just pushed up off the seabed and kicked his way up. The water became warmer and warmer the closer he swam to the surface and Naruto tried his best to remain out of the sun. Eventually the faint noises of machinery teased him from the edge of his senses and the silence was broken. He swam up to the bottom of the ship and reached out to touch it. He channeled Chakra into his hands and legs and somersault lazily, placing his feet and hands on the bottom of the boat. Then, slowly, he began to crawl his way over the hull, hanging on upside down with adhesive Chakra. His head broke out of the water first and he carefully checked around him, craning his head upwards to see if there were Skynin who could see him. All he could hear was the sound of the waves crashing against the hull of the ship and the seagulls crying out mournfully. He checked the position of the sun and his eyes widened behind his mask. He quickly ducked and watched as two sky shinobi flew past as streaks of gold. After they were gone, one limb at a time, 
Naruto began to silently scale the side of the ship. This was perhaps the most difficult part of the mission. Suspended from the side of the ship, Naruto was extremely exposed. The patrolling Skynin seemed to swoop past the ships every three or four minutes or so and it wouldn't only take one of them to spot him and raise an alarm. The Umbu were skilled and strong but not strong enough to take on an entire army especially if there was a cage level or multiple jonin level shinobi on board. Naruto's ears twitched and he suddenly darted up the side of the hull and broke into a sprint. Water slid effortlessly off his black cloak and his heart pounded in his chest as he climbed up one of the two large cylinders that seemed to act like engines. He dove for the nearest cover as soon as he could, coming to rest on a metallic gray platform and ducking behind it. A moment later two shinobi strolled past above him. A metallic catwalk spiraled around much of the huge tower that rose up into the sky and Naruto could hear the two men talking quietly to each other. Naruto held his breath and froze as the two men walked over him without stopping and disappeared. Naruto exhaled and swallowed. He crouched and with a quick burst of chakra he leapt up to the skywalk, grabbing the rail and flipping over it to land silently on the metal. He crouched again and jumped flying high up into the sky and grabbing hold of the next rail. He used it as a hold as he twisted his body, planted his feet on the side of the ship and disappeared in a flicker of movement. It only took him a few minutes to reach the top of the ship and he peeked over the edge. The deck was mostly empty. It was a straight stretch of concrete and iron with a series of towers and balconies on one side. There were two grooves that ran from one end to the other, where a pair of metal seat-like objects sat. Behind them was a lift and Naruto could imagine Sky Shinobi rising from the lower decks and being propelled into the air. It was time for sabotage. The young blonde Umbu scanned the area and silently leapt onto the deck. He dashed for the towers and hid himself in the shadows, crossing the expanse of the runway in a matter of moments. He reached into his clock and pulled out a bundle of explosive notes. For the next few minutes, he planted them on anything that looked mechanical. He had no idea how exactly the Sky Country technology worked but if the enemy had gone to all the effort to build a series of cogwheels and thick rubber bands on the deck then they surely must be important. After he was done he checked the sun. He was grinning behind his mask, the sheer excitement and danger of the mission sending a thrilling rush through his body that combat drills and simulated battles could never bring. There was a few minutes left and he hoped that his team had managed to complete their parts of the mission. He formed a hand seal and hid in the shadows, waiting. He would soon see. High above the sea of whirlpools a flock of seagulls circled around the very top spires of the three enormous vessels. They cried out mournfully and their brethren responded. As the lead bird opened its beak to let out another cry light flared and, before it could make a sound, disappeared in a rush of searing heat. Simultaneous explosions rocked the deck of all three ships. Iron and concrete was smashed apart underneath the powerful class 1 explosive notes. Billows of black smoke rose into the air, dirtying what had been a beautiful sunny afternoon. The boats trembled and sirens immediately began to sound. Naruto flinched underneath the wave of expanding heat and lowered his hands. Adrenaline and chakra surged through his body and pushed off the concrete and leapt towards the runway. Henge. Naruto formed a seal and transformed. He was surrounded by a puff of smoke and when it dispersed an umbu stood there one twice as tall as and much broader than Naruto was. The first of the Skynin appeared on deck and Naruto dove at a pair of them. The first held a kunai launcher and sent half a dozen bolts of deadly steel straight through the transformation's head head. The disguise was dispelled with a pop of smoke and Naruto used the pair's obvious surprise to his advantage as he slipped underneath their guard. He lashed out with his leg and a kneecap cracked the second Skynin falling to the side. A roundhouse kicked and the application of Chakra saw the shinobi catapult away. Naruto twisted his body as he spun around to face the first shinobi, who had recovered from that split-second hesitation and lunged at him with the two-handed implement in his hand. He brought it down from over his head but Naruto dodged it, the butt of the kunai repeated slamming into the concrete with a heavy thud. A spring twanged and a kunai slipped through the sleeve of his cloak. Naruto reverse gripped it and spun his arm around in a horizontal arc. The black blade popped through the Skynin's elbow in a spray of blood. Naruto twisted it out, changed his grip and slashed at the shinobi's face. The blade dug into flesh and the Skynin collapsed, bellowing in pain. Naruto left him there as he twisted arm and sent the wired kane back into its spring loader. Hands blurred as Naruto channeled his chakra. 
he manipulated its nature, twisting it throughout his body and increasing the high-frequency vibrations of it, and lightning burst from around his fingers. Naruto bought his hands down and he drove into the technique. Chakra fled his Tenkitsu, wasted and unused as flickering blue dome of Chakra howled around him, but Naruto didn't care as he released his technique into the very deck of the ship. Lightning release, electromagnetic murder. Powerful streams of lightning erupted from the ends of his hands and into the concrete surface of the deck. The lightning tore through it with ease, giant arcs ripping large slabs of concrete apart with its powerful piercing qualities. Arcs of brightly glowing whitish-blue lightning sprung up all over the deck, lashing out at everything around it. The fire from the explosions continued to rage and clouds of black smoke drifted up, mingling with the occasional spark of lightning chakra. When Naruto raised his hands, the deck looked like it'd been through an earthquake. More and more Skynin were pouring onto the deck now. As Naruto heard the boom of a distant eruption and saw the tower of one of the other boats go up in flames, he smiled grimly. It was time to leave. The shinobi around him were yelling and metal tore through the air. Naruto's feet blurred as he sprinted down the deck of the ship, jumping over piles of cracked and shattered concrete. Kunai whistled past his ears some were too close and a blade appeared in his hand, parrying them away as the ferret-masked umbu raced to the end of the deck and dove. For a moment he felt weightless, suspended above the rippling ocean underneath, and then he plummeted. He twisted in the air and made a single sign. A shadow clone appeared and Naruto used its back to soften his fall. It exploded as Naruto pushed up on it, somersaulted and landed neatly on the surface of the ocean. As smoke rose, sirens blared, and the Skynin patrols began to converge, Naruto dipped beneath the surface of the water and disappeared. It was a wearied and wet group of Umbu operatives that met up at the rendezvous point several kilometers north of the coast. They hid within an inlet, sharp wet stones hiding them from view as swarms of Skynin occasionally soared over them. Beneath his cloak, Naruto was shivering as he and Tao waited for the rest of the squad to join them. For every minute Naruto waited the burden on his shoulders grew heavier and heavier. Maybe they wouldn't return. Maybe he had gotten his comrades killed. His umbu tattoo burned and Naruto stiffened. From out of the murky water came Komaki, the woman limping as water dripped off of her. Tawa was by her side in an instant, hoisting her up and laying her down on the rocky ledge. He began delving into the medical kit as he treated the bloodied gash on her leg while Naruto watched on. He was transfixed by the oozing lound and didn't notice Komaka turn her head to regard him. Ferret, she called out quietly and Naruto met her mask. Komaki had been decidedly cool but still professional about the sudden change in command. You did extremely well. Shut up, idiot. Tawa snapped as Naruto managed a tentative smile. Laying there, talking like you're dying, it's just a stupid cut. He pulled out a needle and thread. We'll sew it up for now and the medicnin can look at it when we go back home. Home. Naruto remembered what he risked the lives of his comrades for and suddenly found himself feeling conflicted. He loved his Kanaha, there was no doubt about it at all. He loved the third Hokage the man who had taken hold of him and pulled him out of the pit of loneliness and despair. But he didn't want his teammates to die either. His tattoo burned again and Naruto watched as Daichi emerged from the water carrying Yuka. A sky shinobi followed him, fingers flicking in umbu code, and Naruto nodded at the possessed enemy. Daichi quickly bound and gagged the Yamanaka-possessed shinobi and Yuka released her hold on him. He instantly stiffened but Daichi was there pressing down on his arm with quick light jabs and sealing off Tenkitsu. Yuka groaned as she pushed herself up, looking the most tired and fatigued out of them all, but she managed to give Naruto a coy smile and nodded her head respectfully. The last one to arrive was Kage. He was almost 20 minutes late and arrived as Naruto was beginning to get truly worried. He slunk out of the water, almost invisible even to Naruto's eyes, as tired as the rest. With the whole team here, Naruto stood over the unconscious Skynin, keeping guard, and let them huddle together and rested. There would be no sleep but Umbu were particularly adept at going long hours between short bursts of rest. Naruto's chakra was as fine as ever but he was mentally exhausted. Still, there was protocol to follow and after a few moments he beckoned Tawa to come and guard the Skynin while he summoned Inma. The Monkey King looked around, taking note of the exhausted shinobi, and nodded at Naruto in an almost friendly manner. The crystal ball shone and Naruto made his report. Hokage-sama, 
Naruto began quietly. We have completed all three objectives. We destroyed the decks of Sky Country's ships, so they shouldn't be able to launch their fighters. Kage infiltrated and wrecked the rudders of the three carriers, so they won't be able to turn around until they get that fixed, and we have an enemy officer here ready for interrogation. Excellent work, Naruto, the Hokage sounded extremely pleased. That almost made the whole thing worth the effort. This will make Tenzo's job significantly easier. You have possible saved a great many lives today. Naruto exchanged a quick look with his comrade. Kage nodded at him and the boy felt a weight lift off of his shoulders. Thank you, sir, he said. He eyed the prisoner. We haven't interrogated the prisoner yet. I was wondering if you wanted to be on hand while we do so. Yes, I am very interested in what the enemy has to say, the old man's voice was as hard as stone and Naruto reflexively winced. It only took a moment for Yuka to stir. She popped a solider pill in her mouth and walked over to the prisoner. She knelt down, placing two hands at the side of his head, and concentrated. Naruto watched carefully as the Yamanaka probed the enemy's mind. Of all the intelligence gathering techniques in the world, the Yamanaka were the best at what they did. Yuka's eyes fluttered. I can see flashes, the island where they lived, he grew up with his mother and two sisters, one works as a chef. She trailed off. I see the attack on Kanaha. She grew silent. Ferret, we have a problem, she called out. Her hands were beginning to glow with a shimmering chakra as she dove deeper and deeper into the enemy's mind. There's something else, a weapon or a castle or... She frowned. It's hard to tell, it's blurry but I think I can yes. I recognize those two mountain peaks. What does this weapon do? Naruto questioned. The crystal ball glowed as the Hokage remained quiet. Dark release. Yuka trailed off. Dark release. Kage echoed. I have never heard of such an elemental affinity. Is it a bloodline? It's a myth, the third Hokage's voice interjected. It's a theoretical concept that explored the idea of the use of human suffering and anguish as a way to generate chakra. There was some significant promise behind it chakra is made up of physical and mental energies and human emotion can play a very big part in producing chakra but nothing ever came of it. The weapon is powered by it. Yuka murmured quietly. There was a noticeable glare coming from her hands now. It, this man believes, or has been told, that the weapon could destroy an entire village in a single use. Naruto felt his blood chill. No such technique exists, he said quietly. Ah, Naruto. The third Hokage sounded wistful. You would be surprised at what exists in this world of ours. Yuka continued to concentrate and Team Sigma watched. Suddenly, the man's eyes shot open and rolled into the back of his skull. He opened his mouth and let out a gut-wrenching scream. Tawa uncharacteristically swore and Naruto took a quick step back. Daichi activated his Byakugan. Scatter! He yelled. Team Sigma disappeared in a blur of movement as the man continued to scream. Yuka made to leave but let out a cry and collapsed. Naruto, just about to enter his body flicker, darted forward and grabbed her. His eyes flew down at the sky nin. Black ink was crawling over his face, expanding in a wave of spirals. He jumped back and propelled himself out of the inlet just as a huge surge of chakra flared from within it. The inlet disappeared underneath a ball of fire and lifted Naruto and Yuka up into the air. They soared, coming down over some rocks but then Inma was there and he grabbed the two of them. As streaks of gold began to zoom towards them from the sky, Team Sigma scattered and fled the area. What happened? Kage asked quietly as they came to rest in a clearing deep within Fire Country's forest. There was a time release seal, Daichi answered. He bowed his head, the body stance of the normally enthusiastic man looking apologetic. Because I blocked his Tenkitsu, it didn't activate in time. He started screaming because the seal malfunctioned. He paused. It's what saved our lives. I bet that the explosion would have normally occurred the moment Yuka entered his mind. Yuka panted as she lay on the ground. She looked pale. Naruto couched down beside her and gently placed his hand on her forehead. It was covered in sweat and the white mask turned to face him. Behind it, Naruto could imagine the cheeky blonde smiling at him. Are you alright? 
He asked quietly. You can nodded. I left his mind really quickly, she said weakly. It makes me sick when we do that. Give me some time and I'll be good to go. Good, Naruto murmured. Now, did you see anything else? Two things, she panted. Names. Shino. Anchor Vantian. That's all. Naruto turned to Inma and found the Monkey King eyeing the crystal ball carefully. Naruto was horrified as he saw the giant crack that ran through the center of it. No light shone from it at all and Inma did not look pleased. This was an artifact dating back to days of the roaming Senja clan, the large monkey rumbled. With this crystal you could buy a whole city and the lives of everybody in it. Can you fix it? Naruto asked. Not here, Inma answered. His yellow eyes came to rest on Naruto. Perhaps Sarutobi could in time. Naruto gritted his teeth. Ferret, Komaka said quietly. What are our orders? Naruto wanted to say I don't know. He wanted to send a messenger monkey to Sarutobi and ask for instructions. However, the more he thought about it the more his frustration at the situation faded. He had worked with the third Hokage for years and he knew exactly what the old man would tell him to do. Sorry guys, he said tiredly. But it looks like we have to move again. Nobody made a sound. If the prisoner was right then there's a dangerous weapon that might destroy Kanaha, Naruto said. He raked his hand through his spike blonde locks. Yuka, you said you recognized where it was. Yuka nodded and pointed it out on Tao's map. That's only an hour or so from here, Naruto said grimly. We'll rest for five minutes then move out. Inma. He turned to the Monkey King. Tell the boss where we're going, just in case. Inma nodded gravely. I normally wouldn't allow it but summon me if you need to, he said. He folded his arm and his leaf headband glinted. I will not allow our village to be destroyed. I won't either, Naruto promised firmly. Inma eyed him. Huh, he commented. You just might turn out okay. He disappeared and Naruto turned back to his tired, wet, and cold team. Come on, guys, he said with forced enthusiasm. Let's go save Kanaha. He paused. Again. No pressure, Daichi said brightly. Chapter 8, Chains of Hatred 4, Counterattack. The six members of Team Sigma were exhausted. Their morning had been chaotic. The afternoon promised to be no better. At the moment, Many of Team Sigma dozed quietly on the backs of man-sized primates. They darted through the trees with just as much proficiency as the Umbu towards their destination. Naruto absent-mindedly used his chakra to stick to the warm furry surface of his summon, his eyes closed and his breathing relaxed. The wind rushed past him, ruffling his hair and flapping his cloak, while Naruto and the rest of his squad took the precious few moments they could to rest and recover. Long shifts and resting where you can were second nature to his umbu team, while Naruto had spent many unpleasant nights by the Hokage's side as the old man defied his age and went about his business without a wink of sleep for days on end. Whenever it seemed like he would doze off without permission, Sarutobi whacked him or dumped water over his face. At the time, Naruto had just thought the old man was being his usual sadistic and horrible self. Now, as he put his experience to use, Naruto looked underneath the underneath and appreciated his hellish training even more. The summons took them a fair way of the distance but even they too started to tire. As they approached their destination, Team Sigma stopped and Naruto thanked the summons gratefully. A little more rested, Naruto led Team Sigma to the coordinates they had received from the enemy officer on foot. The closer they were, the more apparent it was that there had been an enemy presence in the area. Entire swathes of the forest had been swept aside and black oily smoke rose into the air. Some parts were still alight, the giant trees of fire country burning brightly as fire roared through them. There was no sense of reason or logic that Naruto could deduce from the pattern of the burns it seemed random and chaotic, acts of vandalism and destruction rather than any important strategic goal. There were several villages in the area, small and unimportant towns with populations no greater than a thousand. They made their living off of the forest, harvesting wood, and sending it further south via river to fire country's trade cities along the tea fire border. The first village they came across had been utterly destroyed. Small fires were still burning over the large blocky stone buildings. 
Naruto's fingers darted in umbu code and with a streak of movement all six of them secured the destroyed village. Naruto stood in the center of it, his mask hiding his turbulent emotions, as he stared at the large pile of charred and burning corpses in the middle of the town. The smell was acrid and foul and it brought tears to his eyes at least, that's what Naruto told himself as he walked around the pile quietly, looking at the husks of men, women, and children. The village had depended on Kanaha for protection and the leaf had failed them. The small Chunin team that had been deployed there probably for general policing duties hadn't managed to put up much a fight and the dozen shinobi had been killed. Their corpse had been torn apart and desecrated, used as target practice and spat on. Naruto could smell urine from one of them and his blood boiled with anger. Ferret, Tawa muttered but there was a questioning tone to it. He was trembling, Naruto suddenly realized, and stared down at his hand in abject fascination. His fingers were shaking and he forced them into a first, squeezing them tight. It wasn't fear that swept through his body but a sudden and savage fire of hatred. He wanted to find who did this and he wanted to kill them slowly and painfully, tearing them piece from piece. The rest of his team was looking at him now and Naruto closed his eyes. He breathed in deeply, ignoring the smell and bottling his hatred, and he released it on the exhale. Shinobi rule number 4, a shinobi must always put the mission first. Shinobi rule number 25, a shinobi must never show emotion. Let's go, Naruto said quietly and emotionlessly. The umbu nodded and disappeared. Tawa hesitated and patted the young blonde on the back in a somewhat clumsy manner. The two of them disappeared an instant later. They were well within the coordinates of the target area. It was a huge area and they could have spent a week searching without any luck, even with the Byakugan on their side. However, it wasn't long before Team Sigma came across the next location of significance and rendezvoused with Squad 5 of Gamma Team. The ground was black. Naruto stared down at the broken and bloodied body of his comrade and watched as Komaka placed a delicate hand on the broken masked man's neck. A wide blue eye stared back at him as Komaki rose and shook her head silently. Naruto hadn't thought so. Directive 7 hadn't been enforced the bodies of the Black Ops unit hadn't been destroyed as protocol dictated. Even a wounded and dying shinobi would have gone of their way to burn the bodies, to stop the enemy from learning the secrets of the village. Naruto felt somebody behind him and turned. We found three more, Yuka said quietly. Her voice was somber. Most were killed in combat. One was still alive when they took him. It seems that they performed a battlefield interrogation. It was messy but there's still enough left for me to have a look. Go, Naruto ordered. Yuki nodded and disappeared. Naruto took a deep breath and his hands flipped through seals. He raised them and blazing cone of flame swept from his palm and gently enveloped his comrade. The blue eye continued to stare at him unblinkingly as fire began to consume the body. Naruto turned. There were other comrades to attend to. Sometime later, Team Sigma met up at the base of a large tree. Kunai were scattered over the ground and there was a splotch of blood that was still dripping from large fern leaves that grew up and around the trunk. There was no hesitation in Naruto's stance or voice anymore and his mind had hardened to stone, unable to deal with the horrors of what he had seen. Naruto would shelve them and deal with them later. From what I found it seemed as if Squad 5 was trying to link up with Captain Uzuki. Yuka reported. They were patrolling the border along T country when they received an urgent message to return and regroup. They were on their way to meet up with Uzuki but they were ambushed. Captain Uzuki must have found something, Kage said quietly. Of all the umbu, he seemed the most unaffected by what he had seen. She couldn't have known about the sky country fleet, so there must be something else here that drew her attention. I have the coordinates that Uzuki gave Bird 3, Yuka said referring to Squad 5's former leader. It's close. Right then, Naruto said and he turned. His voice was flat. We have a new secondary objective to locate any other survivors of Gamma Team. Our primary objective remains locate whatever weapon Sky Country has and destroy it. Go. Six figures blurred out of the clearing. The wind whipped past him as Tenzo clutched onto the feathers of the hawk beneath him. It was a large bird, a class 3 summon with dark brown feathers and sharp yellow eyes. Behind him crouched eight of his subordinates, their white masks emotionless. Tenzo nodded and glanced around, seeing the other five summons soaring beside him. 
It had been a long trip and Tenzo knew that some of his men would be tired chakra adhesion techniques could be quite draining. Nonetheless, his destination was rapidly approaching and soon they would dismount and fight. Judging from the copious amount of smoke rising into the air, the enemy may have been a little bloodied already. The hawks schemed over the tops of the trees, their talons rustling the foliage, and Tenzo raised his hand. The umbu around him waited for his signal and, at his mark, dropped off the hawk and disappeared silently into the forest below. Tenzo followed them, letting go of the feathery neck of his hawk and flipping over backwards. The wind howled in his ears and the ground rushed to meet him before the umbu captain righted and landed silently on a large tree branch. The hawks dove down into the forest and disappeared with large puffs of smoke. Tenzo hadn't seen any long-range enemy patrols and was hoping that the foliage of the forest around them would keep the dispersion of the summons hidden. He raised a hand and made a few signs. The umbu formed into their squads, Tenzo's own coming to crouch before him. They darted from tree branch to tree branch as Tenzo led them towards the distant sound of crashing waves. Towards the enemy. Team Sigma came across more burning villages as they trekked across Fire Country's southern fields. They all bore similarities to the first one they had inspected. There were hundreds of kunai littering the empty streets and burning homes, fired haphazardly and in greater numbers at great speed. Large craters and pits adorned the surface of the ruined towns, pockmarked craters signifying where explosive spheres had detonated. Fires blazed unchallenged. Smoke filled the sky with a black haze. Bodies burned. They found more Kanahan in, Chunin given the task of guarding and policing the towns they had been assigned to. Some had put up a fight and bore defensive wounds. A few had even managed to kill their attackers or so the debris seemed to suggest. Most had not. Most had died quickly, surprised and tactically disadvantaged against their flying foes. Some had taken a little while longer to die. The fires of hatred in Naruto's belly were stoked with every desecrated and tortured corpse he came across. There was no time to dispose of the dead. Bodies were left where they were to burn, men, women and children disappearing under the flames. But for every town they scouted it became more and more apparent that there were survivors. I patrolled through here once, Daiichi said quietly. The group had paused to stare at a large stack of bodies piled indiscriminately together at the center of the town. There was no fire here perhaps the enemy hadn't had time or perhaps they wanted to leave a message. Either way, it gave Team Sigma the first opportunity to truly gauge the number of fallen. This town had a significantly bigger population than what remains here, Kage murmured. There were several hundred broken and battered bodies. Perhaps they escaped. Yuka offered quietly. Unlikely, Komaka spoke up. We would have seen tracks or signs of them during our search. Perhaps the enemy took them, Tawa suggested. It was not a pleasant thought. It would be better to have died with their families and friends, safe from the careless brutality that the Skynin had shown. Naruto frowned and they pressed on. They found more signs of fighting. A team of Kanaha shinobi had been conducting a mission in the area and had gone out fighting. Huge strips of the forest had been torn apart by the force of explosive notes and a series of deep puncturing scorch marks that bore the signs of a lightning release technique. Intense fighting had occurred a little further down the track and there was still chakra laden in the air. There were no bodies but smoke and ash filled the air and there were burn patterns against a tree trunk that suggested that a body had been disposed of here. More umbu had been killed. Some had lived to dispose of the bodies. The landscape was beginning to change as they approached farmlands. Flat open plains dotted the surface between large swathes of forest. Stone ruins jutted out from between rice paddocks, ancient ruins from wars long past. There were no signs of the farmers and the farmhouses were mysteriously deserted. There was no sign of forced entry or an attack the occupants had simply vanished. As they scouted the surrounding area, searching for signs of Gamma Team or the weapon, Kage paused and stiffened. His hands flashed invaders, due west, closing in, two clicks and Team Sigma scattered, diving into the forest and setting up defensive positions. Naruto gave the signal to hold and waited. His emotions were turbulent underneath his stony and hard exterior, chipped as it was, and he couldn't help baring his teeth up into an unseen and angry snarl. Wait for the enemy. Attack the enemy. Capture the enemy. Interrogate the enemy. Dispose of the enemy. Yes, Naruto decided grimly. 
He liked that plan and suddenly his umbu tattoo burned and his hatred was gone in an instant as a squad of white masked dark cloaked blurs shot into the forest. Naruto pressed his finger on his tattoo and pressed it while holding up his hand and giving the signal to hold position. He used the body flicker and appeared before the leader of the new group of shinobi. Identify, he said roughly, tense and alert. The lead umbu cocked his head. Mantis, he replied blankly. We are responding to Gamma Team's Captain Azuki Yojo's request for priority assistance. Identify. Ferret, Naruto replied. Team Sigma. Mantis cocked his head. Sigma. He echoed. You are out of your operational jurisdiction, Sigma. Elaborate. Naruto frowned behind his mask. My orders come from the Hokage, he said firmly. Very well, Mantis conceded. Where is Captain Uzuki? Naruto stared at the new group for a second. While they had confirmed that they were indeed Umbu nobody in Kanaha's history had ever cracked the Fuinjutsu written into the Umbu tattoos there was something about Mantis that put him on edge. Nevertheless, he raised a hand and the rest of Team Sigma appeared behind him. Uzuki is missing in action, Naruto said quietly. He drew himself up. Gamma Team is scattered, presumed dead. The culprit. Mantis asked quietly and without emotion. Sky Country, Naruto explained as the two groups of Umbu settled around each other. They've worked their way through the area, burning villages, and murdering civilians. They used Chakra and machines to fly and launched an attack on Kanaha. There was no discernible reaction to the news. Point of origin. The other squad leader asked. The Sea of Whirlpools, Naruto replied grimly. There are two combat platoons on their way to take them out. Our intel suggested that the enemy had a weapon in this area capable of destroying Kanaha. We're on our way to locate and destroy it. I see, Mantis said. His voice and tone was still the same and suddenly Naruto found it really irritating. He sort of wanted to shake the other man by the shoulder and see what would happen. Mantis seemed to be thinking. Very well. We will render assistance. Naruto raised his eyebrows at that. You will, he said quietly. Team Sigma has point in a current priority one status. Your former mission is suspended you are drafted under Team Sigma's command and will assist us. Very well, Mantis said with a short but respectful nod. Ferret has command. What's your team designation? Naruto asked as the two squad leaders rose up from the ground. Classified, Mantis replied shortly. I am unable to disclose any information about our former mission and current classification. I apologize. Naruto was skeptical at that. He eyed the new Umbu closely and sent a pulse of chakra through his tattoo. Almost immediately he felt the return pulses, five beats of unique chakra patterns responding in unison. With a shrug, Naruto decided that whatever mission that was so secret that even he as the Hokage's personal assistant didn't know anything about was none of his business anyway. He was just glad for the extra firepower that the new Umbu squad would bring with them. The ground rumbled. Naruto paused. Mantis cocked his head. The ground rumbled again and Naruto swiveled his head around. The trees were shaking and far beneath the surface of the ground a terrible groan echoed. The ground shuddered again and before Naruto's eyes large chunks of earth rose up. Roots were exposed and torn apart, trees split apart and fell and a loud hum filled the air. The various stone ruins around them started to flicker and glow with purple bolts of energy. Something big was coming, something vast, and Naruto could feel the pressure in the air abruptly shift. Ferret. Daichi yelled over the din. He gestured. The ground has just lit up with chakra. There's something coming. With a loud crash the last of the trees bent and snapped a large geyser of dirt exploded before them. The Umbu team ducked as stone and dirt was blasted all around them and Naruto watched with nothing less than complete wonderment as the filthy stone ruins that littered the countryside began to lift up in the air. Purple energy cascaded over them, stripping them of dirty crust and revealing gleaming white marble and stone underneath. They rose into the air and it became apparent that they were all connected. Blank-faced monuments appeared from the surface of the earth, gazing down at the world around them imperiously and with a start Naruto recognized the designs from the fleet. Sky Country, he signed over the noise. He hesitated for a single moment but there was no time to consider the possible ramifications of his orders. 
His instincts told him what to do next and he obeyed. Jump. The two Umbu squads darted forward, jumping between falling pieces of rock and fallen lumber as they sped towards the rising object. It was slowly revealing itself to be a fortress, armored and decorated with the same designs that the Sky Country fleet had. It was bigger than the ships, though, at least twice as tall and five times as wide as a single Sky Carrier. The fortress slowly rose up into the air, tearing free from its last bonds that held it chained to the ground. The roots of Fire Country's gigantic trees were torn apart and began to fall to the ground. Eleven dark blurs shot up the falling roots and leapt up to the side of the fortress as it rose into the sky. Tenzo watched from the cliffs at the condition of the enemy. Team Sigma had certainly done their jobs well. The fleet was idling in the middle of the bay, coils of smoke rising into the air. He peered into his binoculars, seeing patches of blackened metal and stone where explosive tags had detonated. The decks of each ship had been torn to pieces but there were already a significant number of Skyn encircling around the fleet. There must have been another way to launch the flyers from the ships, although it must be slower than using the deck. He drew in his squad captains and began to devise a plan of attack. Anchor Vantian arose from its slumber. It was more than an aircraft. It was a fortress, a flying fortress. Stone and iron towers rose into the sky the largest settled in the very center of the stronghold. Large stone faces had been carved into the sides of the fortress, blank and emotionless visages who stared down at the world with indifference and superiority. The largest of this face was at the front of the massive flying fortress, built on top of a circular archway that led from the very depths of the stronghold. On the back two large protrusions, looking quite similar to oversized magnets, glowed with black light as massive amounts of chakra was poured into them. Roots dangled down from the stone and concrete towers, stowaways from the fortress' sudden ascension. Foliage and dirt were not the only stowaways. On one of the outer towers, eleven black specks clung to the stone with chakra as they slowly scaled their way up the building. Naruto climbed next to Daichi, paying very careful attention to what he was doing. Chakra warmed his hands and feet as he used it to stick to the surface of the stone and drag himself up, inch by inch. It would have been much easier for the group to simply climb up with their feet but the sudden emergence of that much chakra would have made the group easier to spot especially given where they were. Daiichi continued to look up with narrowed veined eyes, his Byakugan active. The Hyuga kept a keen eye on the pair of Skynin standing on the balcony just above them. He nodded quietly to Mantis and Kage, who each pulled themselves up to the bottom of the alcove's stone floor. Naruto gave Yuka the signal and Tawa and Komaka grabbed the blonde-haired Yamanaka woman as she let go of the wall to make a hand seal. Mind-body switch technique. Yuka went limp, held up in the air by Tawa and Komaki. Naruto waited for a few moments and signaled Kage and Mantis. The two shinobi pressed up against the balcony floor and the blonde Umbu heard a soft gasp and then nothing. He smiled vindictively underneath his mask as Daiichi gave the all-clear and signaled the Umbu squads to move. He flipped over onto the balcony and stood up. A Skynin stared back at him with amusement, ignoring the fate of his partner as Kage and Mantis gently lowered the body to the ground. As Daiichi, Tawa, and Komaka vaulted over, bringing Yuaka's body with them, Mantis made a hand seal and pressed down on the Skynin's corpse. It began to gently sink into the stone and disappeared without a trace. Naruto turned to Daiichi as Yuka motioned for Kage and Mantis to prepare to dispose of the body she was possessing. What can you see? He asked. There was a thud behind him and Yuaka's eyes suddenly shot open. Daiichi frowned. I, don't know what I'm seeing, he admitted. There's an immense chakra source at the center of the fortress. It's running through the entire stronghold, through every building and hallway. There's so much of it. He shook his head. I wonder how they managed to build this right in our own territory, Yuka mused. She shook her head her blonde ponytail bobbing up and down. I don't understand how nobody saw this. It came from underneath the ground, Mantis observed indifferently. Nothing in his body suggested that he was concerned. It's likely they either built it or resurrected it in secret, away from patrols and shinobi. The farms, Kage muttered darkly. They were abandoned, not attacked, and the occupants had had enough time to pack up their belongings. Plants, perhaps. Komaka wondered thoughtfully. Regardless, Tawa said firmly. It's here now. 
Can't we worry about that later? Because, I have to admit, I'm more worried about the weapon. His words paused the group. It's a flying fortress, certainly formidable, but hardly a weapon, Kage noted. He glanced around. Perhaps the weapon is inside. There's enough chakra here too. Daiichi trailed off. He ran a hand through his short cropped hair. I don't know, man. I've never seen so much chakra, and it's so dark. It almost makes me sick looking at it. Those words made Naruto hesitate. Is it human? He asked quietly. The chakra, I mean. Daiichi faltered. Perhaps not, he admitted softly. There was a tense silence. Mantis and his squad were unmoving with Team Sigma considered each other grimly. A tailed beast. Komaki asked quietly. They're all accounted for, Kage said, shaking his head. Nobody asked him how he knew that. Nobody was looking at Naruto, either. Do you see anything else? Naruto asked Daiichi, desperately wanting to break the sudden tension that had filled the air. Daiichi scanned the fortress with his Byakugan. I think, I see rows of chakra sources, he said, squinting. It's faint the other chakra is just everywhere but I think one of them might by Captain Uzuki. Mantis shifted. We cannot let the enemy acquire an Umbu captain, he said stonily. The information she holds is too valuable. There are safeguards, Tawa said. Seals that stop captains from speaking. Protocol dictates that they should have already activated, Mantis said stiffly. If that is Uzuki then she is still alive. Directive 7 must be implemented at all costs. Naruto felt his team draw up around him at that declaration. Even Cage's body language was suddenly radiating wariness. Despite the horrendous nature of it, Naruto could see the other squad leader's brutal logic. He slowly nodded and felt his team twitch around him. I agree, Naruto said softly. He took a deep breath and held his stony facade. I will take Team Sigma and implement Directive 7. If possible, we will extract the captain. If we're unable to, we will implement Directive 7. Mantis, take your team to the center of the fortress and destroy the chakra source that powers the building. Mantis nodded. We'll meet up at the source of the chakra if we can. If we can't, destroy the fortress and scatter. Naruto finished. He took in a deep breath, reviewing his orders. Let's go. The long stone corridors of the fortress were mostly deserted. Team Sigma darted through them silently, black streaks against the flickering lights. A strange hum had settled over them, the sounds of the engines keeping Naruto from being distracted by his thoughts. So far the eleven Umbu had remained undetected. Team Mantis, for lack of a better designation, would have to be closing in on the center of the fortress soon. Naruto wondered what they would find from what he had heard and read and the long talks he had had with the third Hokage he couldn't really picture one of the tailed beasts being here. Kanaha, like all of the great villages, made a point of securing intelligence about the Jinchuriki. It was always essential to know where they were and what they were doing and, to a point, they were all accounted for. Daiichi, who had point, raised a hand and signaled them. Naruto nodded and gestured at the rest of his team. Sprinting forward, the Umbu team whizzed around the corner in a flash and had jumped on the three unaware Skynin in a flash. Komaka went high, her hands flicking as she used her senbon and wire to restrain all three shinobi. It would have only taken them a second but Kage, Tawa, and Naruto were there, sharp blades tearing through vulnerable flesh and ending their life in an instant. Naruto was breathing deeply, practically straining on the tips of his toes as his kunai withdrew from the back of the taller man's skull. He gently lowered the corpse onto the ground and watched Yuko wove a genjutsu. It sprung around the corridor, invisible streams of chakra wafting in the air. A single touch on the skin and the average shinobi wouldn't even toss a second glance to the piles of bodies stacked to the side. They moved on, occasionally coming across unaware patrols or off-duty skynin. Naruto worked with the others and ended their lives cleanly and quietly. Many conflicts were over in seconds and the young blonde umbu mused that once their technology and aerial advantage was taken away from them the Skynin were truly nothing special. Ahead. A dozen plus two over two levels, Daiichi signed. Team Sigma crouched around the single door, waiting. 
Hands quickly flashed in a series of short odd movements of the fingers as the team communicated to each other and Naruto gave out his orders. With a final nod, Naruto tensed and prepared himself. He closed his eyes, taking a deep breath and settling his emotions. His chakra coiled and pulsed in his body as he turned his head and nodded shortly at Daichi. The Hyuga ran a finger the hinges and pushed the door open. It swung open silently. Naruto dove into the room and appeared in the center with a flash. They had entered a large chamber, with two long tables stacked with food and equipment. Past the chamber on both levels was a long corridor filled with cell doors. There were two levels, a set of stairs on either side leading to the upper level, which consisted of a series of metal catwalks that crisscrossed over the cells and hallways. There was half a dozen skine in laughing and lazing around the tables, the rest were standing as guards or deeper within the cells. The Umbu team moved in without any hesitation. Naruto pressed down on the ground, enhancing his muscles and limbs with chakra and pushed. He soared through the air, landing neatly on the crosswalk above him. Daichi and Komaki appeared beside him and together they darted for the surprised and unsuspecting Skynin. Below them, Kage and Tawa tore through their enemies. Tawa was wielding a glowing crimson mace as he expertly used it to crush through the startled enemy's defenses. An arm snapped, the man howled and Tawa raised his weapon. It flashed the mace became a hand axe and Tawa brought it down and cleaved the man's skull in half. Yuka, her hands twisted in a sign, wove a genjutsu that sent three shinobi to their knees with the hands clasped over their ears, screaming incoherently. Kage ended them a split second later, the man quickly and efficiently landing short, sharp fatal blows with a dull black machete. A second later, the enigmatic squad captain was darting through the lower level of the cells and launched at the first enemy he saw. Above them, Naruto twirled and dodged as he fought three men at once. Their hand-to-hand -hand was mediocre at best and they were no match for his superior speed. What he lacked in strength he made up for with a kunai, a blade at the end of a short, sharp vicious jab sliding between the ribs. He formed a sign and shadow clones formed around him, each holding a kunai. The first appeared crouching and lashed out in a horizontal arc, puncturing the kneecap. The second appeared on the Skynin's right his kunai swinging up and into the man's elbow. The third appeared above the now immobilized opponent and brought his down in a two-handed blow that sent the blade right through the man's eye socket. The fourth appeared above the last Skynin's head, who remained unaware and raised his weapon. The large burly man brought down the butt of his kunai launcher and cracked Naruto's skull open. The blonde umbu gurgled then disappeared in a puff of smoke the replacement was successful as Naruto appeared where the fourth shadow clone had been and dropped down on the other man's back. He held a long piece of wire in his hands and coiled it around the Skynin's throat. He was off the man's back in a second and holding two kunai attached to either end of the wire, he tossed them towards his earlier clones. Two of them darted forward, grabbed each end and threw themselves off of the railing. The wire scraped against the metal bars and the improvised noose around the Skynin's neck tightened. Something snapped but Naruto paid it no mind, forming a sign and sending sleek flash of bright white fire from his hands at the next enemy. With Daichi twirling around him, delivering short and graceful jabs, and Komaka pinpointing enemy vital points with her unnerving accuracy and subtle but dangerous water techniques, the fight was over in less than a minute. His blood racing, his hands clenched and panting, Naruto stood amongst the bloodied corpses of his enemies and felt nothing but numbness. Daichi, Tawa, and Kage covered the exit as Naruto pressed through the cell chambers. They reeked of blood and pain and suffering but the frightened occupants men, women, and children of fire country judging by their clothing seemed unharmed. Naruto wondered who had been the previous inhabitants before them. They came across a large cell at the end of the hallway. Komaka kicked the door open and Yuka and Naruto darted through the room. It took all of his conditioning not to gag and lose his rations at the smell that awaited him. Urine, sweat, blood, and the rest assaulted his senses. Flesh rotted and flies buzzed around them. Blood splattered the walls of the interrogation chambers, half-dissected and tortured men and women lay on benches around them. In the center was a rack, where Naruto saw a purple-haired woman strapped to it. Perhaps she had been pretty once, even beautiful. Now, her face was swollen and bloodied, her teeth cracked and some missing. Her clothes were mere tatters, hiding nothing of her bruised and beaten body. Naruto saw a bone protruding from her arm, white fragments embedded in the skin around it. He smelt the odor of body waste and heard the short, 
rattling breaths that the woman was making. Captain! Yuka hissed. She darted over to the woman and knelt by her. Azuki! Yojao opened her eyes blearily. There was unbridled panic and fear within them. Naruto held a hand to his tattoo and sent a pulse through it. Yojao's eyes went wide and suddenly her eyes were glistening, her tense body relaxing instantly. Yuka undid her binds and raised her hands. Glowing green light poured off of them as Yuka began to treat the captain's wounds. Suffering. Yojao's voice was croaky. Naruto paused from surveying the tortured fates of the corpses in the room. Most of them looked like Leaf Nin, although there were none that he personally recognized. Human suffering, our suffering, the fuel. Something the Hokage had said flicked through his mind. Dark Chakra. He muttered and knelt down by the captain's side. The create chakra using negative emotions is that what this is? Suffering. Yojao trailed off. Abruptly, she lashed out with her good arm and gripped Naruto tightly. The young Umbu winced at the sudden strength, feeling her fingers dig into his forearm. She stared into his mask and Naruto felt as if she was looking past the thick ceramic plate and into his eyes. I didn't break. She hissed dangerously. Yuaka's hands were shaking as she ran them up and down the captain. I didn't break. Do you understand? I didn't break. Naruto gently took her hand and she let go of him. His voice raw, he nodded once and gently lowered her hand back into her lap. I understand, Captain Uzuki, he said roughly. You followed Directive 5 in the line of duty. Well done. Yojao nodded blearily and her head lolled back. She appeared very tired all of a sudden and her last words were whispers. I didn't break. She whispered. I listened, let them talk, they're not very well trained, I didn't break. She paused. The zero-tailed demon worm. She hissed. The what? Naruto's eyes shot up behind his mask. Captain. Yojao just shook her head. Color was beginning to return to her cheeks as Yuaka's medical techniques began to take effect. Naruto watched as the captain wobbled to her feet, looking unsteady and gripping the side of the rack tightly. Naruto reached down and unstrapped a bandage from his thigh. He helped wrap it around her broken arm and used a kunai and a piece of wire to create a makeshift splint. I don't know what it is, Yojao said after a few moments. Her voice was considerably stronger and her face had hardened over. I don't remember much, she confessed. I blanked out for most of my imprisonment. But I heard that term being used the zero-tailed demon worm. Naruto was silent, his mind racing, as Yuka finished wrapping her bandages around Yojao's leg and stood. I've patched you up but you're not combat ready, she said quietly. The pain meds aren't going to last very long. Captain, Naruto's tone was respectful. By order of the third Hokage, Team Sigma has command on this mission. He raised his hand, flipped through some seals and summoned a small chittering monkey. Yuka, take notes. Captain, please tell me everything you know. It started slowly at first, water vapor rising from the surface of the ocean and rising up towards the sky. It slowly spread across the sky country fleet, and shrouding each of the ships and engulfing the view of the men and women on board with a sea of white. It hung there, unmoving, as the water release experts from two Umbu platoons manipulated the vapor of the water until they had created a rolling wave of fog that had blanketed out the sky. It only took moments for the Skynin on board to realize that the fog was unnatural and alarms and bells began to blare. On the shore of the Sea of Whirlpools, Tenzo watched and waited. Once the fog had completely shrouded the fleet and he raised his arm and bought it down. Two dozen blurs streaked past him, dashing across the water and diving underneath the surface. Tenzo bought his hands together and molded his chakra. Wood release, world of trees wall. He slammed his hands down on the ground and channeled his inherited powers into the ground. The ground shuddered as countless wooden branches sprouted from the dirt from behind him, interlacing and forming a wide net-like wall. They towered over him as Tenzo expended considerable chakra to grow them. He finished his technique and allowed the net to tower over him as he raced through the next set of hand signs. Wood release, Great forest technique. Tenzo thrust his arm forward and suppressed a grimace as the tissue of his right arm was transformed into wood at a cellular level a wholly unpleasant situation. He brought his hand forward and the wood in his arm suddenly shot forward towards the beach. 
it schemed over the water, broadened and disappeared into the mist. The targets were stationary and it was unlikely that they would have moved in the last few moments. Tenzo continued his technique until he felt a jolt. He adjusted his stance and dug his feet into the ground. Squads 1 through 4 move out. He barked. Twenty white-masked and black-cloaked Umbu jumped onto the bridge and sprinted along the wood towards the mist. Straining somewhat under the use of chakra, Tenzo brought his other arm up and manipulated the net of branches behind him. With a sudden burst of movement they vaulted over his head and formed a makeshift roof or shield over the bridge. He almost immediately felt shudders as the first sounds of explosives and whizzing kunai arose in the air the sky in almost immediately preparing a defense. The rest of the Umbu had deployed further up and down the coast, boxing in the fleet and flanking them from all directions. It left Tenzo and his squad on the beach alone, his teammates surrounding him on all sides in a defensive formation. Flyers burst out of the mist, rapidly firing kunai from the mechanical objects in their hands. The shield jolted but Tenzo held it firm. Kunai lacked the penetrating power to crack through the toughened wood and even the explosives merely glanced off of it. The enemy had realized this and a squad of the flyers dove past the oncoming Umbu and veered straight for Tenzo. His teammates tensed but Tenzo held firm and watched with no little satisfaction as loud cries pierced through the air and a flash of brown feathers slammed into them. The hawks were bigger, tougher, and knew only loyalty to the leaf and they tore the sky in apart with their razor-sharp beaks. A large explosion resounded from inside the mist, and then another, and Tenzo nodded to two of his teammates. They lowered their hands and the mist began to rise. Soon the fleet was visible, fresh smoke billowing out into the sky as the Umbu platoons tore through them and their guards. Large clouds of insects swarmed through the sky as three Aburama sent their Kikaichu up into the scattered formations of the sky Nin. Their machines, which needed a certain balance of chakra to operate, powered down and plummeted helplessly down to the ocean floor as the chakra devouring insects swarmed over them. It was going well just as Tenzo had calculated. However, he frowned as he saw one of the carriers veering away from the battle. Explosions detonated all around it as the Skynin on board used their full armament to keep the advancing Umbu at bay. Either Team Sigma hadn't been able to sabotage the ship's rudder as well as the others or they had made good progress on the emergency repairs, Tenzo didn't know. He was just about to inform his Yamanaka teammate to pass on new orders when a large cloud of smoke suddenly appeared behind the ship. A loud crack filled the air and suddenly something appeared, twice as tall as the carrier and infinitely meaner. The giant toad, its slit eyes gazing down at the carrier, reached for its gigantic gleaming blade and swept it across the carrier. It tore through the hull like a warm knife through butter, sending electrical sparks and debris everywhere. The Class 5 Summon, one of the three gargantuan warrior of the toad clan, croaked contently and Tenzo could make out a small figure perched on its head, arms folded across his chest. Jiraiya. Tenzo breathed. His calculations would be wrong this battle would be over much, much quicker than he had anticipated. With the power of one of the legendary three in a class 5 summon, Sky Country had no chance. The counter-attack had been a complete victory. Naruto helped Yojo limp out of the interrogation cell even as the captain continued to quietly tell her story to Yuka. He kept an ear out as the pieces began to fall into place. Yojo had noticed increased movement in the area during her standard patrol and had come to investigate. What she had found was an unknown enemy raising the local villages and towns, one after the other, capturing some of the populace and slaughtering the rest. Messengers had been sent perhaps they had been intercepted or perhaps they would be arriving at a battered Kanaha soon. She had called for all squads to converge on the areas and had begun launching guerrilla attacks against the invaders. They had done well in the first hour or so decimating the enemy as they had landed to loot and pillage the towns they had just burned. The Skynin were extremely capable in the air and specialized in the use of tools and weaponry to a great degree. On the ground, against the force of Umbu hand-to-hand -hand and ninjutsu training, they had hardly been a threat. Unfortunately, the Skynin had had sheer numbers and an aerial advantage and soon it was a game of cat and mouse between the two forces one that Yojo had lost in the end as the commander of Sky Country had entered the field. The man, elderly with white hair and yellow eyes, had torn through the umbu like they had been genin. Yojo was an umbu captain and one of the elite definitely one of the top 20 in Kanaha. She had fought fiercely as her squad retreated through the forest but the commander had been just as fast, skilled and deadly as the umbu. 
Her squad killed, she had been captured for interrogation. She hadn't gone into the details and Naruto didn't really want to know. Naruto helped her limp out from the cells and his squad formed around him. Naruto's thoughts raced. There were at least a hundred prisoners in the cells although Yojeo had said there had been many more in the early hours of her imprisonment. Technically, his mission and the safety of the Leaf Village superseded everything. Naruto could leave them there and let them burn along with the rest of the Flying Fortress after they had destroyed the weapon. The Hokage wouldn't fault him nor would anybody in Umbu. He couldn't. His heart wrenched at the thought of allowing the helpless that he had been sworn to defend die when he could have helped them. He took a deep breath and made his decision. Daichi, he said quietly. The Hugo looked at him, his body language quizzical. The upper decks we passed those large flying vessels could you fly them now that you've seen how the chakra works? Daichi considered it. I could, he said. He chuckled and scratched his head. Well, I could glide it, I think. Landing could be rough, he admitted. But hey, look on the bright side we can land. Land and crash have two very different definitions, Yuka muttered. She had popped a soldier pill, as had most of the others, and was looking much fresher. Still, that was two soldier spills in the span of a day. Team Sigma would be feeling it tomorrow. We're going to split up, Naruto decided and there was no hesitation in his voice. He had made his decision. Kage, you're in command of Daichi and Captain Izuki. You'll free the prisoners and take them to the upper decks. Daichi will steal one of the transports and you'll load them in. Wait for us there. Daichi flashed a thumbs up at Kage, who merely scoffed at the exuberant Hyuga. Naruto paused. If, if you come under attack and you can't hold, evacuate. He said quietly. If that happens, or we don't show up, you'll be in command of Team Sigma until the Hokage decrees otherwise. Understood. Kage nodded fractionally. The rest of us will link up with Team Mantis and destroy the chakra source of the fortress, Naruto finished. He left out that he had no idea on exactly how to do just that. The zero-tailed demon worm. He had never heard of it but that was the world of Shinobi. Information was the most powerful asset a Shinobi could possess. If Sky Country had indeed captured an unknown tailed beast then it was likely that they could use its immense chakra to power their flying fortress. However, everything Naruto had heard about the tailed beasts told him one thing, they did not like being confined. There were stories from other villages when tail beasts had broken their bindings. They had never been nice stories. With that thought in mind, Naruto stood. Kage and Daichi began organizing the prisoners as Yojeo watched, while Tawa, Komaki and Yuka formed up around him. With one last wave farewell, Team Sigma split and Naruto led his group out of the cells and back towards where they had come. After a few moments, the alarms began to blare. Naruto and his squad paused as they surveyed the area. It was just another deserted hallway, cracked and faded stone walls like the rest. He glanced at Komaki, who shook her head. Mantis has been found out, Tawa noted grimly. Let's go, Naruto said shortly. They dashed through the hallways, navigating the somewhat confusing labyrinth by relying on Komaka's above-average chakra sensing skills and listening for the sounds of distant fighting. Tremors were running through the wall as they got closer to their destination. There was no need for secrecy anymore and their weariness had vanished in the wake of adrenaline. They met light resistance and tore through them with well-practiced ease, the average skine in no match for the well-trained Umbu squad. The sounds of fighting grew louder and louder and resistance began to increase as they got closer to where Team Mantis was advancing. Naruto sent a powerful array of Shuriken Shadow Clone into a pair of Skynin and entered the main hallway where the battle was taking place. Mantis and his squad were pressing forward against dozen of Skynin, Kunai launchers, and explosions tearing through the walls. Perhaps it had just been one corridor to begin with but the fighting had widened it dramatically. Naruto's squad joined up with Team Mantis and Naruto sidled up to the other squad leader. We will hold here, Mantis said calmly, despite his bleeding shoulder. He jerked his head. Down that corridor there seems to be a large room with podium. Beyond that podium is a central shaft where I believe the chakra is emanating from. I only caught a glimpse. Naruto digested the information. 
We will provide cover for your retreat once you have completed the mission, Mantis ducked gracefully underneath a hail of kunai as a wall of hardened earth rose from the stone floor, blocking the rest. Naruto thumped the man on the back and signaled his squad. Mantis watched and signaled his men. On his count, they all withdrew behind the wall and formed hand seals. Chakra surged through the air as each member of Team Mantis stood up and molded powerful flame techniques. The air howled as the fire billowed out in all directions around them, forcing the advancing Skyne in to retreat or duck for cover. Naruto nodded once to Mantis and his team jumped from cover in a blur. They paused, molding Chakra for the body flicker technique, and flickered to the other side of the hall. The fires were beginning to retreat as Naruto and his squad made his way past the beleaguered defenders and slipped into the passageway that had been indicated. Their feet pelted along the ground and his heart roared in his chest. His veins were alive with chakra and adrenaline as the squad of four darted through the empty corridor. They approached a set of double doors and stormed through them in a single push. They entered a large room and halted. Blank-faced statues lined the columns on either side as, up on the podium and seated in a throne-like chair. A white-haired man with ornate robes peered down at them imperiously. His face looked amused but yellow eyes revealed his emotions loathing and anger and disgust and a thousand other emotions all melded together into an unquenchable hatred. Behind him was the shaft that Mantis had mentioned and a deep dark light emanated from the very center of it. Naruto recognized the man from the descriptions Captain Uzuki had given him. It was the commander of the Skyne and the man responsible for the attack on Kanaha and the murder, pillage, and raising of the outlying towns and villages in the region. Hatred like he had never felt before towards anybody rose up in his chest like there was a monster squirming to get out. Naruto wanted nothing more than to dart forwards and cut that damnable smirk of the elderly man's face. I am Shino, the man said quietly. His yellow eyes watched them keenly as the umbu spread out below him. I am the lord of the land of Sky. Commander-in-chief of the village hidden in the winds. Who are you to come into my domain? Ferret, Team Sigma, Naruto replied shortly. He spoke the next words as wrote. You have declared war on fire country in Kanaha. Surrender and mercy may be shown, he added at the end unconvincingly. Shino smiled and chuckled in amusement. Both he and Naruto knew that there would be no such thing. Naruto's hand clenched around his kunai and his chakra began to race through his body. It was time to end this war. That's it for part 3. Thank you for watching and see you on the next video.